Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about cardiovascular risks of stimulants in the elderly. I'll be talking for about 20 minutes, probably less today. If you have questions while I'm talking, you can type them in. This will be posted later on both YouTube and Facebook. And as usual, I will start with the takeaway. So despite fairly widespread um, media attention to a recent study which suggested an increased risk of cardiovascular deaths in elderly people who take stimulants, the bottom line is that stimulants, including Adderall and Ritalin, are generally safe and well-tolerated and effective in ADHD for people who are even in their seventh, eighth, or ninth decades. So that's the takeaway. So where does this concern come from? So the, the stimulants medication's action is primarily on elevating norepinephrine and dopamine levels. And we know that particularly elevating norepinephrine has impacts on the cardiovascular system. So it can increase heart rate. Stimulants can increase heart rate. They can increase blood pressure. They can exacerbate existing arrhythmias, and in some cases, may create arrhythmias. Um, and in rare cases, there's, there have been a handful of cases of creation of brand new cardiomyopathies. So cardiomyopathies are damage to the heart muscle itself. Um, most of the blood pressure, heart rate increases or risks are thought to be through the effects to the nerves that affect, that, that innervate both the heart and the vascular system throughout the body. So overall, on average, the increased increase in heart rate is actually, although statistically significant, is a fairly small one. So group averages for heart rate increases are less than five um, point five counts a minute. And most of the group average studies looking at the effects of stimulants on blood pressure have found less than a 10 point, usually close to a five point increase in either systolic or diastolic blood pressure. So we are not talking big increases, um, but again, those are group averages. So many people have no increase and smaller numbers of people do have larger increases. Um, but again, that's separate from whether, and we know that overall having elevated high blood pressure is a risk factor for heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events. Um, but the small magnitude of this effect does not suggest that that's a primary cause of contributor to death. So um, jumping around a little bit, the, um, the incidence of diagnosing ADHD in the elderly has increased substantially. So if you think about it, someone who's, who is in their 70s now, that means they were born in the 1950s, they were a child in the 1960s, ADHD was not even widely recognized among children then. So they've gone through their lives, their, their cohort, people weren't aware that ADHD existed when they were children. And given that there was a delay of several decades between while widely acknowledging, recognizing and treating ADHD in childhood and extending that into adulthood. So it wasn't until the 1990s that there was much attention paid to the fact that two-thirds of people with ADHD have some substantial amount of it continuing into adulthood. So by and large, the people who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s now grew up in a world where their ADHD wasn't recognized when they were children. And for most of their adult lives, it wasn't recognized. And my experience clinically is that there is a widespread that most adults in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s are fairly well aware of ADHD, fairly well aware that adults can have it. And even highly educated people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s are often astounded that ADHD could be more than just a child's um, 
diagnosis. So awareness of ADHD has grown significantly over the last decades, particularly in the elderly. Aware um, use of diagnoses of ADHD have increased substantially, particularly in the elderly, and use of medications to treat ADHD have increased, particularly in the elderly. So although much of the early concern about ADHD and cardiotoxicity focused on children, and I'll get to that in a moment, we know the overall rates of cardiac death or problems in children are vanishingly small, tiny, tiny numbers. But as you increase in age, the number of older Americans who are having heart attacks, strokes, arrhythmias, other cardiac problems markedly increases with age. So given that the background level of potential heart conditions rises dramatically, it makes sense that we should be concerned. Are we giving medications that may worsen cardiac conditions? to a population that is already at high risk or experiencing substantial amounts of cardiac problems. So going backwards to children, again, the rates of children dropping dead of heart attacks or other arrhythmias is not the other arrhythmias, strokes, other cardiovascular heart related problems are rarer than neighborhood of one out of 100,000. These are quite rare events, usually strong genetic connection, um, usually strong family histories of this. And there was enough concern that in Canada in 2005, for most of the year, they pulled Adderall XR from the market because there was so much concern that this might be causing sudden death in kids. And statistical analysis, they, they returned Adderall to the market because they did not find a marked increase in sudden death rates for kids who were on Adderall XR. And in fact, some of the number crunching studies done at that time suggest that kids on the Adderall actually had a lower rate of heart attacks than or sudden death, cardiac death than the control groups, partly because the pediatricians and child psychiatrists were doing a good job, taking a good family history, doing an evaluation, taking the EKG if indicated, and screening out any kids with family histories of sudden death at young ages from cardiac deaths. So it's not that Adderall reduced the rate of, you know, it wasn't that Adderall reduced the risk of dying from heart attacks or other cardiovascular events, it's that any contribution, any increased rate was very, very small, and they did a good job of screening out kids who potentially might be at risk of dying from such, such effects. So the recent media attention was on a study that was just published in October. So the study looked at elder, you had to be 66 to get into the study. It was a chart review study, so um, looking at sudden adverse cardiac events, so those were heart attacks, TIAs or strokes, or ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and they, so these were serious events potentially resulting in death. And what they found, so the average age in the study was mid 70s. Again, you had to be at least 66 to get in. And they were looking at, is there an increase in death from these cardiovascular events? in the first month after starting on stimulant medications, and does that risk continue to increase while people are on the stimulants? So the studies did find about a 40% increase in adverse, really serious, bad cardiovascular events at the one month mark after starting, um, but failed to find any increased risk at the half year point to the one year point. And among those, even at the one, one month time, the rate of heart attacks actually didn't vary from the con control group, um, but the rate of ventricular arrhythmias, which can, again, be lethal events, and the rate of strokes or transient ischemic events was um, also increased, again, about 40% higher. So to put that in context, in this age group, um, so in this study, of those who had started stimulants in the first month, about five out of 100 had some adverse cardiovascular event. 
put that in perspective and, and to get the 40% increase, that meant that about, and this is consistent with other studies for that age group, about three and a half to four individuals out of every hundred who are not on stimulant medications are having an adverse cardiovascular effect. So going from about three and a half people to about five per hundred is an increase. It's a measurable increase. It, you know, that, that, that's there. But again, the fact that these staying on the medications didn't continue to have an effect suggests that there are some vulnerable people and that bad events can be triggered in the first month, but that for someone who's doing stably on these medications, um, as long as you're checking heart rate, blood pressure periodically, there is no reason from this study to pull people who are already doing well on the medications off the medications. Again, there was no increased risk at the half year point or at the one year point. Um, so getting back to what's good clinical recommendations, some his, some medical doctors you know, for decades have been teaching that history is 80% of the diagnosis, and that's maybe an arbitrary number, but it's, it's highlighting that a big percentage of what's picked up is carefully listening to the patient. Most patients who are gonna be at risk for having a heart attack, stroke, or arrhythmia have had either previous events of dizziness, have family history of cardiovascular events, have listening carefully to what the person's telling you and, and asking careful questions about potential cardiovascular related events will give you much of what you need to know. A physical exam, certainly listening to the heart, listening for murmurs, um, looking at whether circulation seems adequate throughout the body or differentially affected, um, seeing whether the patient's you know, dizzy when they stand up right away, other signals or symptoms of cardiovascular potential issues can be evaluated the physical exam. Currently, even though there are several groups who have I will say misinterpret, misintrude, even the cardiology organizations and the American Heart Association do not have a blanket recommendation to do an EKG in everyone, whether they're a kid, whether they're elderly, whether they're middle-aged, who starts on a stimulant. The recommendation is that it may be useful if indicated by a history and physical exam. So those professional groups, I mean, particularly cardiologists who would stand to make lots of money if, if we put it in as a strong recommendation or requirement that you had to be on how many kg before you start stimulants are not recommending that because the data doesn't support it. And the data suggests most people, even including most elderly people, including most youngsters who have a clean history regarding cardiovascular matters, who have a clean physical exam, regarding cardiovascular matters can start safely on stimulants with an EKG. I would say one other indication would be if the patient themselves is that worried and that an EKG can be a reassuring step for them that their cardiac condition will be not adversely affected by starting a stimulant. Um, I know lots of pediatricians, lots of psychiatrists, practice cover your ass medication and uniformly require an EKG before starting a stimulant. But again, the cardiologists who know this data and understand it better than I do, do not have that as a blanket recommendation. So again, the bottom line is we know that studies have shown that stimulants can be effectively treating ADHD symptoms in the elderly. There's also studies looking at people with pre-existing hypertension and most people with pre-existing hypertension managed by medications can be safely treated with stimulant medication. Sometimes that involves a dosage adjustment, often it doesn't, but again, pre-existing hypertension itself does not seem to be a contraindication to starting stimulants even in the elderly population. So that's about all I have to say for today.
Next week's topic is going to be addressing hyperfocus and whether that's the same or different than the state of flow. And it's in honor of the um, psychiatrist who died this year and his name I will have to practice to be able to pronounce correctly, who Mikhail Slava, Eastern European name, um, I, who, who widely publicized and studied the concept of flow. So that'll be next week. Stay, so, stay healthy, stay happy, and I will be back Friday at 11. Bye.